OK, so the last discussion question for the entire novel. Bum, bum, bum. Question five. Stoner has regrets about his relationship with Edith. If I had been stronger, he thought, if I had known more, if I could have understood. And finally, mercilessly, he thought, if I had loved her more. This is on page 272. Do you agree? Why or why not? If you do agree, what more do you think he might have done? Okay, so page 272. Um, So let's look at line one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, line seven from the top. A new tranquility, which means peace, had come between them, between Stoner and Edith. It was a quietness that was like the beginning of love. And almost without thinking, Stoner knew why it had come. They had forgiven themselves for the harm they had done each other. And they were wrapped in a regard of what their life together might have been. Wrapped here means uh, engrossed or like captivated. Uh, of what their life together might have been. Almost without regret, so almost, not entirely, but almost without regret, he looked at her now. In the soft light of late afternoon, her face seemed young and unlined, so without lines, without wrinkles. If I had been stronger, he thought, if I had known more, if I could have understood, and finally, mercilessly, he thought, if I had loved her more. So, of course, mercilessly here, it means he's being merciless to himself. So he's thinking back on their relationship. Um, sort of after you can say after it has ended, like the relationship that he used to know was Edith, that kind of conflict and fighting and torture now has ended. So he's able to now look back on that part of their relationship. And he blames himself. He was not stronger, he thinks. He did not know enough. He did not under understand. And he did not love her enough. Uh, I'm not quite sure that I agree. Like, this seems to be the same thing that we were just talking about. How Stoner does what he thinks is right. Um, and carries all the burdens that come with those decisions. So here it's like his decision to marry Edith came with the cost of having this kind of woman for a wife. And he keeps blaming himself. Like, if only I had, I had been stronger and knew more, maybe we could have had a better marriage. And uh, you know what? I'm willing to grant that if he had known more, if he had understood uh, what Edith was about, like why her personality was this way, yeah, maybe they would have had a better marriage. And now Stoner now understands, of course, because this is the same kind of uh, childhood that Grace has. So now that he has seen uh, what Grace has had to deal with growing up, he kind of understands what Edith had to go through growing up. So he can finally begin to understand why she is this way. But what about the other parts? Stronger. What kind of strong? Because it seems like uh, what Edith hates most about her new married life is that she thinks her husband is too strong. Right? He takes up too much space in her life. So I'm not quite sure what kind of strong Stoner has in mind. If by strong he means like self-endurance, uh, 
able to bear his feelings without having to share them with Edith or like willing to bear his love for her without having to express it uh willing to to yield to her and to give Edith what she needs instead of what Stoner feels like he wants to give her that kind of strength maybe would have resulted in a better marriage but I, I'm still not quite sure because it seems like Edith is mainly unhappy because she's married. Not because she's married to Stoner, but simply because she still has to listen to a man. She thinks. Um, so the discussion about strength is also the discussion about love. Love her more? To give her more of what she needs? Maybe. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know whether they would have had a good marriage. It would have been a better marriage, sure, but maybe it would not be a good marriage. So uh, that also answers the last part of this question. What more could he have done? You know, not really, though, because now when he's thinking back, He's thinking back with all of the knowledge and understanding that he has now. But with the knowledge and understanding that he had when he was young, I don't know if he could have done something better. He didn't understand how the way that he expressed his love was hurting Edith. So if he couldn't understand, maybe he could have listened more or observed more. So, for example, when we're talking about Edith, we have the almost the exact same kind of evidence and, and information that Stoner has. Almost. Stoner doesn't know what she does when after her father dies. But other than that, we have we know the same things. And so we have been able to sit and talk about what is going through Edith's mind when Stoner pursues her when they marry, when they go on honeymoon. Um, but Stoner apparently did not understand. So maybe if he tried to observe more and, and listen more and think about it, he may have started to understand even when he was young. But who knows? And that's kind of the point of this question, right? Which is we only live one life. Um, when you think back, you really don't know like how or even whether you would want to change anything. You know, for example, um, Steve Jobs had that very famous commencement speech, right? Where stay hungry, stay foolish, that one. His main message actually is not to stay hungry, stay foolish. That was just the conclusion. His main message was uh, to connect the dots of your life to see how it has meaning. Um, and. The idea here is that once you reach a certain age in your life and you look back on the important moments, those are the dots. Um, but whether those moments make sense, whether you can see how these dots, once you connect them, lead to the present day, the person that you currently are, that is to connect the dots. Individual dots do not make a picture. You have to connect the dots to make the picture. So that's the process of finding meaning in your life. And that's what Stoner is doing. The point here is not uh, what he could have done better. Because as he says, it's almost without regret. So he doesn't really feel a lot of regret. It's more about looking back at the direction and trajectory and shape of their relationship and also of his life. Um, and, you know, that's one of the main reasons that I like this novel so much and that I chose it for us to read. Uh, because a long novel is not just a story. It's also an image. Um, it, it, if you connect all the dots of the novel, they create an image. And only after a certain length do, do we get a sense of the, the impact or influence or even emotion of that image. 
And so this novel is the image of a man's life. From the very beginning, when he grows up on a poor farm and knows nothing about the world, to the very end, uh, when he realizes that the point of life is to use passion and love for every moment, to care about what happens and what you do. That kind of journey uh, can only be found in longer works of literature like a novel or a movie. Um, you know how sometimes after watching a really good movie, you think back on, wait, how did this story begin? How did we get it from there to here? That's the same thing that, that a good novel can do. And so hopefully uh, you were able to feel some of that when reading Stoner. Uh, okay, so that's the end of the discussion of the questions. Do you want to ask me something? Teacher, yeah, I'm curious about uh, why it is can bear when Stoner love Catherine. Um, because in the uh, in the uh, front part, it is don't have a big action about that big emotion. <laughs> and right, yes. So I'm curious about that. Okay. So last week when we were talking about Stoner's affair with Catherine, we mentioned that it improves his family life. And um, Billy here is asking, um, it seems like Edith didn't really care that Stoner had an affair, but he, she's his wife, like what's going on? Um, so remember that in that scene, Edith ends the conversation by saying, uh, it's natural, I suppose, a man of your age. So for her, it's not unexpected. It's not a big surprise. Um, and also think about the way that uh, she was brought up, the kind of family that she grew up in. Uh, we had discussed before how her family does not seem to have a lot of warmth, a lot of kindness. It's more about... Uh, the father and mother playing the roles of a father and mother, like the father making money, the mother taking care of the house, and therefore they expect Edith to play the role of the daughter, to learn painting and music, to find a good husband. But there's very little human warmth. Um, so this idea of playing of role, if this is what uh, Edith understands in family life, then for her, the fact that Stoner has an affair is also just Stoner playing the role of the middle-aged husband, right? She says it's natural, uh, it's to be expected. Um, so that's why she's not surprised, because that's apparently part of the role of a husband, is at some point during middle age uh, to have an affair. But also from a practical point of view, as we discussed, um, Stoner's affair does make him uh, a better husband and a, like a more cheerful and energetic presence at home. So um, Edith was also benefiting from the improved family life as well. When we talk about like cheating, things like that, uh, the obvious point is a betrayal of trust, right? You promise someone you'll only be with them and then behind their back, uh, you be with someone else. But in this case, uh, it's not really a betrayal if Edith expects it. And it's not really a betrayal if uh, Stoner is still able to devote part of himself to family life. And in fact, more than he had been able to before the affair. Um, so, it's not like, you know, uh, when we think about affairs, we often think like, oh, you can't love two people at the same time. Yes, you can, but you can't love them in the same way. And some people, I think most people really care about that. Um, how, like, not that you no longer love me, but that you are able to love someone else in a different way that is also equally 
meaningful and important as your love of me. So it's not like uh, when we say betrayal, it's not because you've stolen love from me. It's because uh, you have hidden a part of yourself from me or like uh, you have you are sharing a part of your life with someone else that is not me. So it's actually closer to jealousy than it is to like uh, stealing. I, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yes. OK, thank you. Oh. All right, thanks. Um, other questions? OK, so if nobody has questions, let's go back to the beginning of Chapter 15. Page 229. Um, so remember, at the end of the previous chapter, Stoner had just regained his old courses um, by just refusing to teach composition in a composition course. He, he, the name of the course is still competition, uh, composition, but he's starting to teach medieval literature and the Latin tradition uh, during that time to his students. So beginning of chapter 15. And that was one of the legends that began to attach to his name. Legends that grew more detailed and elaborate year by year, progressing like myth from personal fact to ritual truth. So this is a very interesting way of understanding legends because legends are a part of oral literature. They are passed down from mouth to mouth, from person to person. It's not written down. There's no clear record to compare it to. Um, you only know what other people tell you. And over time, of course, people mishear, misremember, uh, or some people even like to add details for fun to make it more lively and vivid, a story. So that's why the novel line three says it progresses like myth from personal facts, I know this happened, to ritual truth, they say that this happened. In his late 40s, he looked years older. His hair, thick and unruly as it had been in his youth, was almost entirely white. So this is a good moment to point out that the cover of the novel is not a picture of Stoner. I don't know how many of you realize this, but the cover of the novel is a painting. The copyright page, uh, the page right after the title tells us that, uh, no, no, sorry, the back cover, the back cover, Right above the barcode, right above the price tag, it tells us cover painting, Thomas Eakins, The Thinker, portrait of Lewis N. Kenton, detail, 1900. So it's actually a part of a painting of someone named Lewis N. Kenton. But, you know, aside from the uh, physical differences, I do think that the feeling of the painting is quite similar to the feeling of Stoner that we see in the book. So it's a pretty good choice, I think. Uh, so anyways, he has unruly hair that is now almost entirely white. Uh, continuing, this is line six. His face was deeply lined and his eyes were sunken in their sockets. So he has sunken eyes, uh, like deep eyes, I guess you would say. And the deafness that had come upon him the summer after the end of his affair with Catherine Driscoll had worsened slightly year by year, so that when he listened to someone, his head cocked to one side in his eyes intent, he appeared to be remotely contemplating a puzzling species that he could not quite identify. So think about this image. He can only hear with one ear, so he's turning his head to the side, but he's still looking at you. Uh, so it looks like he's puzzled, or it looks like he's thinking. That deafness was of a curious nature. Though he sometimes had difficulty understanding one who spoke directly to him, he was often able to hear with perfect clarity a murmured conversation held across a noisy room. 
It was by this trick of deafness that he gradually began to know that he was considered, in the phrase current in his own use, a campus character. Uh, so today, uh, I guess we would call this uh, like a campus NPC, like a non-playable character from a video game. Like he's a special person on campus, that he was always there. Um, the word character, today, of course, we, we know that it, it talks, it means a, a fictional person in a story. But the older meaning of character as a person is someone who is unique, weird, odd, even, uh, who has a reputation. Uh, that's one of the even older meanings of character is the reputation of your uh, morality and virtues and good standing. Uh, and uh, for our Taiwanese students, it is pronounced character, not character. The emphasis is on the first syllable. Um, so this is pretty cool. He can't, he sometimes can't hear someone directly in front of him but he can often hear people across the room. That's pretty useful. Okay, last line of this page. Thus he overheard again and again the embellished tale of his teaching Middle English to a group of new freshmen and of the capitulation of Paulus Lomax. So embellish means to add details, usually uh, not truthful details, but like entertaining details. Uh, capitulation, page 230, line 2, means surrender, to give up. So the story that we had just read, we now get to see some of the legendary versions. And when the freshman class of 37 took their junior English exams, you know what class had the highest score? A reluctant young instructor of freshman English asked. Sure, old stoner's middle English bunch. And we keep on using exercises in handbooks. So this is very interesting for a number of reasons. First, the entire freshman year of the Department of English only has 37 students. So remember when I first when I said in the first week that college back then was a very special kind of part of someone's life. Not many people went to college. They were very small. That's what I'm talking about. 37 people in one year. How many people do we have? 210? Um, the other thing that's imp another thing that's uh, interesting here is that um, it tells us the fact that Stoner teaches Middle English as a kind of composition actually lets his students have the highest grade on the exam. The competition, the composition exam, which really like makes you think about like how do we teach composition? And this is what the speaker is saying too, right? The last line of this paragraph, and we keep on using exercises in handbooks. It doesn't look like these exercises in handbooks are very useful. So like the that's the question, right? How do we teach composition? How do we learn composition? Most composition courses, including my composition course. The teacher will tell you, oh, how do you write this kind of essay? How do you write that kind of essay? And then do lots of practice and then lots of editing. But really, we already know studies have repeatedly shown that the most important part of learning language is to have content to learn. So, for example, the best way to learn vocabulary is not to take a list of words and to memorize them but to read something that uses these words so that you have something, some kind of content uh, to help you learn the words. Same with composition. The best way to learn composition is not to practice writing, but to have something to write about, to have something that you want to write, that you want to say. Because um, if you don't have any ideas about what to write, then you're just going to be writing a page of cliches and old-fashioned language and just like meaningless words. 
they may have perfect grammar, but nobody will really want to read it. It doesn't really have any meaning aside from like uh, getting you some kind of score in class. And you know, you don't learn to write in order to get a score. You learn to write so that when you do have something to say, you can say it well. The third interesting thing about this uh, dialogue is who's saying it? It's a reluctant young instructor of freshman English. The idea is here we are being forced to teach this boring and, and exhausting course using old fashioned methods. Uh, and no matter how hard we work, we our students still don't do as well on the exam as stoner students. Stoner who didn't even teach composition. He was teaching Middle English. So what are we still teaching composition for? So it's actually a very uh, resentful kind of thing to say. Continuing. Stoner had to admit that he had become, in the regard of the young instructors and the older students, seemed to come and go before he could firmly attach names to their faces, an almost mythic figure, however shifting and various the function of that figure was. So this is one sentence. And it tells us also a, a few things. The young instructors and older students seemed to come and go before he could firmly attach names to their faces. So I remember we read about how he cared a lot about his composition students, and he always held student conferences every day. Uh, but here it says that they passed by or they passed through the university so quickly that he, could, he barely remembers their names. And not just the students, right? Students pass by every year, but even the young instructors. Uh, this really shows us how old he is. And this is also a sentence that tells us that time is passing. But it tells us how old he is because, um, did you know that the older you get, the faster time passes? And it, it, this is a mathematical fact. Here's what happens. When you are three years old, one year in your life is only, is, is one third of your life. But when you are 30 years old, one year of your life is one thirtieth of your life. So if we take memory as a, an image of your entire life, then each year, the new year takes up less and less of your entire memory. In other words, time passes faster and faster. Uh, and that's why like uh, older people sometimes start to forget things or they react slower, or you know, some older people find it hard to change their ideas and hard to learn things uh, because it just passes by so quickly. And that's also why your childhood feels more important because when you were going through childhood, those days took up more of your life. You know, like today, you know, I'm sure like you wake up, you take some classes, you do your homework, you eat, and then it's time to go to bed. Whereas when you were like seven, after school, you had so much time and so much TV you could watch. That's why. Um, and he's, it, this paragraph says that he recognizes that he had become a mythic figure. However, shifting and various the function of that figure was. So regardless of how the details change, he is always portrayed as a kind of myth. And by function here, it means like the role that he plays in the story, the story that the students tell about the university and about him. Next paragraph. Sometimes he was the villain. In one version that attempted to explain the long feud between himself and Lomax, he had seduced and then cast aside a young graduate student for whom Lomax had a pure and honorable passion. So someone that Lomax, uh, a student that Lomax uh, preferred, 
was seduced and then abused by Stoner, according to this story. Which, you know, kind of true. I mean, it's not entirely true, but it's kind of true. Uh, honorable, pure and honorable passion means that it was not love, not romantic. Continuing. Sometimes he was the fool. In another version of the same feud, he refused to speak to Lomax because once Lomax had been unwilling to write a letter of recommendation for one of Stoner's graduate students. Now, this story has it the opposite way. It's not that uh, Stoner refused to help Lomax, which is what actually happened. It's Lomax refused to help Stoner. Continuing. And sometimes he was the hero. In the final and not often accepted version, he was hated by Lomax and frozen in his rank, so he was never promoted. He's still assistant professor. Because he had once caught Lomax giving to a favored student a copy of a final examination in one of Stoner's courses. So again, not true at all. And yet somehow, and that is also kind of what happened, right? Lomax forces Stoner to, to pass one of his favorite students. Uh, and this last version is not often accepted. So like only a few people believe this version. Um, this is actually very good writing. First of all, because this is the only version where uh, Stoner is the hero, right? And yet Stoner is the one who is being abused by Lomax. And also because um, this is this is to do with the craft and skill of writing. If you have some examples, if you, if you have some things you want to put into a list, the most effective way is to put it into a list of three things. One, two, and three. Right? Look at this paragraph. First, he was the villain. Then he was the fool. And finally, he was the hero. One, two, and three. And it works best when the third item is just a little different. So the first one and the second one establish the pattern. It sets up expectations. And the third one sort of changes our expectations. It's not exactly as we expect. And this kind of writing uh, actually is more entertaining and more pleasurable than to simply give us three examples of the exact same kind of thing. So the first two examples just tell a legend, but the third example adds the idea that some people don't uh, accept this version, that it's not just stories that people tell. People actually take sides and decide for themselves whether a story is uh, convincing or not. So it's not just three stories out there in the university. It's three competing stories. Stories that people decide to believe one or not the other. And that adds another dimension to the idea of the myth of Stoner. Next paragraph. The legend was defined, however, by his manner in class. Over the years, it had grown more and more absent, and yet more and more intense. So absent means like he's not always there in uh, the classroom mentally. Like sometimes he's thinking about other things, or like he's being uh, drawn into the literature that he's teaching, that kind of thing. Continuing, line three. He began his lectures and discussions fumblingly and awkwardly. So to fumble means to uh, drop something or like to, to almost drop something. Uh, so here it's like he's almost dropping his discussions and lectures. Continuing. Yet very quickly became so immersed in his subject that he seemed unaware of anything or anyone around him. Once a meeting of several members of the Board of Trustees and the President of the University was scheduled in the conference room where Stoner held his seminar in the Latin tradition. Uh, so this talks about the uh, 
administrative structure of the U.S. university. So in the U.S., a university is run by a president, same as here, but uh, under the pre the president is like the CEO. Uh, and in a company, you would have a board of directors to, to sort of make sure that the CEO is doing what's good for the company and to give advice and to sometimes force the CEO to do specific things. In a university, that group of people is called a board of trustees. A trustee is a xing ren, I think. Like it has to do with trust. Um, so these are the people who run the university. A meeting of these people was scheduled in the room where Stoner is, was teaching. Uh, continuing two lines from the bottom. He had been informed of the meeting, but had forgotten about it and held his seminar at the usual time and place. Halfway through the period, a timid knock sounded at the door. Stoner, engrossed in translating extemporaneously a pertinent Latin passage, did not notice. Pertinent means relevant. Passage means uh, a, a part of the text. And extemporaneous means without preparation. So he was like looking at the Latin and then translated into English as he was reading. Continuing. After a few moments, the door opened and a small, plump, middle-aged man with rimless glasses tiptoed in and lightly tapped Stoner on the shoulder. Look at how this person is described. Small, plump, so like a little round, middle-aged, and his glasses were rimless, wu kuang, and he tiptoes in. Basically, the, the description is making this man as harmless as possible. He, he's probably an important person, but he, it looks like he has no authority at all. And this is, of course, in contrast to Stoner, who has a head of white unruly hair, is engrossed in his teaching. Continuing. Without looking up, Stoner waved him away. The man retreated. There was a whispered conference with several others outside the open door. Stoner continued the translation. Then four men, led by the president of the university, a tall, heavy man with an imposing chest and florid face. So this man looks like he has authority. Tall, heavy, has a big chest, and his face is florid, which means it has a lot of hair, and it's well-kept hair. Florid is related to the word flower, like a blooming flower. Uh, so he, they strode in and halted like a squad beside Stoner's desk. The president frowned and cleared his throat loudly. Without a break or a pause in his extemporaneous translation, Stoner looked up and spoke the next line of the poem mildly to the president and his entourage. Entourage means group of people that accompany him. Be gone, be gone, you bloody horse on galls. So if you look at the words, right, they, they are trying to uh, banish someone, the bloody horse on Gauls. Gauls are French people. The medieval version of French people are called Gauls. Uh, horse son means son of a whore. So this is an insult. Uh, if you look at the word bloody also, this is a, an insult. It's apparently an insult by the enemy of the Gauls. So I guess like the British by uh, the people living in Britain uh, against, I guess, invading French people. So be gone, be gone, go away. So the line looks perfect. Uh, it looks like it fits perfectly in the situation, right? Stunner wants them to leave, and he just so happens to be translating this line. But also note that it says that he spoke the next line of the poem mildly which means without too much emotion, very quietly. So it's not like he's using the poem to insult the president. It just so happens to be the next line. Continuing. 
and still without a break, returned his eyes to his book and continued to speak, while the group gasped and stumbled backward, turned, and fled from the room. That's kind of funny. Fed by such events, the legend grew until there were anecdotes to give substance to nearly all of Stoner's more typical activities. So, you know, at this point, Stoner just lives his life, doesn't care about what other people think. But here it's saying that the myth grew so much that now every uh, weird thing that he does now has a story behind it. Continuing, line three. And grew until it reached his life outside the university. It finally included even Edith, who is seen with him so rarely at university functions. Remember, function means event. That she was a faintly mysterious figure who flitted across the collective imagination like a ghost. Flit here means like how a bird will quickly fly from one tree to another tree. So emerge from one tree, quickly fly over and disappear into another tree. That's what flit means. Uh, so she's so rare that she's mysterious like a ghost. And, and after the colon, we have some of the stories that people tell about her. She drank secretly out of some obscure and distant sorrow. Mm, I mean, kind of true. It's more true of Grace, not Edith. She was dying slowly of a rare and always fatal disease. Notice the word always. In other words, no matter what disease is given her, it's always a fatal one. This is also like half true. She's dying of a disease called heartbreak. Uh, and maybe even a disease called life. Uh, you do know that um, every breath you take is one less breath you can take, right? So, in fact, breathing is a form of suicide. Uh, continuing. She was a brilliantly talented artist who had given up her career to devote herself to stoner. Also half true. She used to do art. She was never brilliant. Uh, and she did give up art, but not for Stoner. At public functions, her smile flashed out of her narrow face so quickly and nervously, so it's not a steady smile. Her eyes glinted so brightly, and she spoke so shrilly and disconnectedly. We, I think we talked about the word shrill, right? It's a word that's used specifically to describe the high pitch of some women's voices, like Jin Rida. Um, but it's not a good word. Like you would never use shrill to uh, describe a beautiful voice. And because it's always used for women, it's also now become a sexist word. So now people try to avoid using this word. Um, but this was in 1965. And so she speaks so surely and disconnectedly that everyone was sure that her appearance masked a reality and that a self hid behind the facade that no one could believe. So facade is the surface, like the, the outside, the exterior of a building is the facade. So here it's saying that everyone is convinced that she is hiding something because no one could believe the person that she presents to the world. Next page, 232. After his illness, and out of an indifference that became a way of living, William Stoner began to spend more and more of his time in the house that he and Edith had bought many years ago. The, so the fact that this sentence ends with many years ago, tells you that the novel is coming to an end. It's starting to look back at earlier events. Very quietly, very gently, only once in a while, but it's beginning to end. 
At first, Edith was so disconcerted by his presence that she was silent, as if puzzled about something. So, like, she can't understand how, why is he suddenly doing this. Then, when she was convinced that his presence, afternoon after afternoon, night after night, weekend after weekend, was to be a permanent condition, she waged an old battle with new intensity. So the phrase permanent condition, a condition is a situation, but it's also a disease. So this is this sentence is from Edith's perspective, seeing Stoner's presence as a kind of disease. Upon the most trivial provocation, she wept forlornly and wandered through the rooms. So on the littlest thing, she melted down. Stoner looked at her impassively, so without emotion, and murmured a few absent words of sympathy. So it's, he, he's not, it doesn't sound sincere. She locked herself in her room and did not emerge for hours at a time. Stoner prepared the meals that she would otherwise have prepared and didn't seem to have noticed her absence when she finally emerged from her room, pale and hollow of cheek and eye. So this is telling us that she was probably crying. Uh, so notice what he's doing. It's kind of the same way that he got his courses back, right? He just basically did his own thing and didn't care about anybody else. Continuing, she derided him or insulted him upon the slightest occasion, and he hardly seemed to hear her. She screamed imprecations, also insults, upon him, and he listened with polite interest. <laughs> when he was immersed in a book, she chose that moment to go into the living room and pound with frenzy upon the piano that she seldom otherwise played. And when he spoke quietly to his daughter, Edith would burst into anger at either or both of them. And Stoner looked upon it all, the rage, the woe, which means sadness, the screams, and the hateful silences. Silence can have many different kinds of silence. This one is a hateful silence. As if it were happening to two other people, not himself, but two other people, in whom, by an effort of the will, he could summon only the most perfunctory interest, which means he had to try really hard to be interested at all in what was going on. Uh, the hateful silence. Silence can have many feelings. It could be an awkward silence. It could be a romantic silence. It could be a peaceful silence. This one is a hateful silence. Uh, perfunctory means like, polite or like superficial, not serious, not very invested, not engaged. Next paragraph. And at last, warily, almost gratefully, Edith accepted her defeat. Almost gratefully. So like uh, almost grateful that she no longer had to fight. The rages decreased in intensity until they became as perfunctory as Stoner's interest in them. And the long silences became withdrawals into a privacy at which Stoner no longer wondered, rather than offenses upon an indifferent position. So the silences, uh, Stoner is able to see them as no longer an attack on him, but rather just a decision to withdraw into herself. So like, she's not silent to hurt me. She's just silent because she needs time for herself. That kind of thing. Um, so in that way, his family life is also, I mean, not resolved, but it's improved in a different way. And, you know, maybe this is what he was thinking about when he said, um, if I had been stronger, maybe we would have had a better marriage. Because here he's being very strong. He doesn't give a shit. Um, and it turns out to work, um, you know, pretty well, pretty OK. OK, uh, let's stop here. This is the last week we're talking about the novel, so do you have any questions at all?
If you have not yet finished the novel, I really encourage you to finish. I have a question. Yes. Um, if we, because I know we will get the final in next, I think in two weeks or next week. And is there anything like specific chapters maybe from the book that we need to like, I don't know, just maybe go reread and focus on more possibly to like, just like review better or? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so yes, so next week we're watching the movie. Uh, the week after that, we're going to talk about the movie. And after the discussion, I will show you the final exam questions, and then you will have one week to do the final exam. The final exam will look exactly like the midterm exam, just with two different questions. Both questions will be about the novel, uh, and it will also be open book, so you have the entire novel to help you. But there are two places that you can focus on. The one place is early in the novel when Stoner is at a bar talking with Gordon Finch and Dave Masters. The second part you can focus on is the last chapter. So when he's dying. OK, thank you so much. Sure. Other questions? OK, so if there are no other questions, that's it. Uh, see you next week to watch the movie. As a teacher, we still yeah. have to um, 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 things and uh, to uh, watch the movie together. Yeah, so um, next week, um, I decided that uh, we're going to watch the movie together, but with the microphone turned off. Or, I mean, if you can guarantee that you're not going to make like noise, you can keep your microphone on so that we can hear like when you get scared or something. But um, you, in any case, you will have to log into Teams at some point in order to uh, take attendance, to create the attendance record. And because we're only going to watch the movie and we're not going to have a discussion, well, I mean, I guess after the movie, uh, I will see if you want to ask me any questions. So, but there's no like dedicated period of time for a discussion on Teams. So it would be better if you log into Teams and join the meeting to create an attendance record uh, from the beginning. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Uh, but you don't have to, as long as you, you join the meeting sometime during the movie and so that I have a record, that's fine. Okay. Okay, great. Mm, I see.